usually talk about medication-assisted treatment and adherence to treatment and medication-assisted recovery and recovery-oriented uh, 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 support services and peer services. And, uh, and, and so to, he said, well, I'd really like you to talk about your LGBT experience. And I was like, oh, what an honor to be able to, to talk about that aspect of my story because it's a really important piece. And there always hasn't been... Uh, an earnest ear toward it. So it, it's, I, I'm really happy to see, uh, first of all, that last panel, amazing. An amazing acts of bravery to talk about their stories publicly in a way that didn't used to happen. So let's give them another hand. So yeah, my name is Tom Hill. I'm a gay man in long-term recovery. And for me, what that means is that I haven't used alcohol or drugs since 1992, that's 27 years. And, you know, like Devin this morning, I, you know, I, I, I wonder about that introduction anymore, and I wonder if it's outdated. Um, I, I hope there's a day when I don't have to identify myself that way. I hope there's a day when those things won't matter about my identity and about my life, but they do matter. And lived experience does matter, and I made that promised to myself early on in this career that wherever I was, especially in tables of decision making where addiction and recovery was being talked about, that I would identify that way. Because people at those tables, people everywhere, need to know what lived experience looks like. And I would say also that lived experience equals lived expertise and that we are all experts in our own lives, and our lives have meaning in terms of what this larger picture looks like, and that what we bring to the table and all the other things we bring to the table are vital, vitally important in that larger discourse. So, but I am tired of it, and I hope that, and I don't know if that'll happen in my lifetime, but I hope that it happens in the young people that were sitting at that panel. I hope that they don't have to carry that burden for the rest of their lives. Uh, it's a burden, but it's also a joy. But it's 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 you know it's a responsibility. With great um, um, uh, power comes great responsibility. I think I'm quoting RuPaul there. So, so in early recovery, you know, I was looking, I was developing some self-reflective skills that I didn't have previously, and I was looking at things that I needed to change in in my life that went way beyond not picking up alcohol and drugs. And so I had really had to answer to myself and to my own cowardice about um, having one foot in the closet and one foot out of the closet. Because I was engaging in sexual activity, but I wasn't identifying, at least publicly, uh, about my sexual orientation. And I felt like in order for me to sort of take this new path, I really needed to uh, change my don't ask, don't tell policy and really move forward with a new me that was very uh, sort of strongly entrenched in who I was. So I had a lot of work to do, and I had, I, you know, I just had a lot of self-esteem work to do, uh, and, and I'll talk about that a little bit more a, a, as we progress through this talk, about all the reasons why that didn't happen, and all the reasons why it was so important for me to build up all those walls. But, and I always joke and I say, you know, I loved coming out so much, that I decided to come out twice. So, uh, and, and, and it, you know, it, it, it's a good line, but there's more behind that. And so when I did come out, it was like an entire burden had been lifted off of my shoulders. And I didn't have to carry secrets, and I didn't have to carry shame, and I didn't have to carry all that burdensome baggage that I was just trudging through carrying up until that point in my life. And so I thought, since this feels so good, to not have any secrets, why do I want my recovery to be a secret? Why do I have to bury that piece of myself once again to tamp something about myself down that people need to know about? Because everyone in my community had seen me as a public nuisance, but I wasn't going to allow them to see me on the other side, rebuilding my life in a meaningful and productive way. It just didn't seem right to me. So this was way before there was any kind of recovery movement that I knew about, but I knew that I had to, like, sort of embrace all these pieces of myself in a new and positive way. So, you know, in that, you know, I, I know the power of coming out. I know that, you know, when, when, when you try to explain to somebody why they should even consider coming out, it's like, 
um, it's like that you don't have to carry any of that stuff anymore. Uh, the power of truth telling, to be able to just say the truth, plain and simple and without shame, and then let somebody else carry that burden. If they have issues, they, they can go talk to their therapist or their sponsor or their mentor or their spirit, spiritual advisor, but it's not mine to carry anymore. And so, you know, cleansing the body and soul of shame is a very, very powerful thing. And I think it's an ongoing thing because I think there's always residues. I can always go back into that shameful place that I'm not enough or that, that, uh, that you know, that there's pieces of me that are, uh, that are never going to, to uh, meet muster uh, and be the same as everybody else. But those are few and far between now. And when they come up, I do have tools to deal with them uh, and, and, get, and get back to right scale. So I told you uh, I got uh, into recovery in 1992. And if you can picture me, a younger me in 1992, uh, physically very weak and frail, uh, weighed about 125 pounds, soaking wet, uh, spiritually lost, and I'd hit so many dead ends that I just had this sort of glazed look in my eye. And... Um, where I was at that time, I was living in Lower Manhattan of New York City, and if you think about that place in 1992, uh, a, a very vibrant and well-organized LGBT community, uh, lesbians and gay men had built an entire uh, infrastructure of social services and health services and community services, and the trans population was slowly, but actually very quickly catching up, and we were trying to figure out how to, how to incorporate bisexuals into that. And so it became this sort of like mix of communities, LGBT. But there was also this huge health epidemic happening at that time. And so this isn't lost on any of us that people were dying every single day. What are people, uh, people are dying every single day now. We have another health epidemic on our hands. And stigma and shame were involved in both of those. So, um, you know, the community had built that infrastructure and was able to sort of uh, take care of our own, but there was something else not happening. There was media pointing fingers, there was the government pointing fingers, there was a larger community pointing fingers that said, you're, it's your fault. It's your fault you have AIDS, it's your fault you're dying, you've engaged in bad behavior, anal sex is wrong, blah, 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 right? And what do we hear now? It's your fault. I didn't put a needle in your arm. You made that decision. And so, you know, there's, the, the, all along I've been thinking there's, there's a lot of similarities here in terms of where that stigma and shame and blame comes from underneath this very puritanical attitude. Because it doesn't happen in other countries. Not like it happens here, right? So when Devin was talking about harm reduction, European countries, Canada, Canada very well developed in terms of, of building that kind of public health infrastructure. I say public health. Like you, you meet a, a, a health epidemic through a public health approach, right? And there's ways to do that. But we don't always think the, those ways, right? So, so I, I'm also looking in 1992 at... At a, at a community that is taking action for itself. It's saying, if you're not going to take care of us, we're going to take care of ourselves, and we're going to fight for the government and for, for, for the society to, to be able to accept what this is for what it is and start paying up. Because every day you delay, more and more people are dying. And this health epidemic actually could have been curtailed much earlier if there had been the right kind of attention on that, right? So it's already gotten out of hand through the 80s up till 1992. And, and the numbers are increasing every day of people dying. So, you know, I, it, somebody said earlier about the connection. I had moved from complete isolation to being a full-fledged community member. And I was loving it. It was like I was making friends. Um, it, I, I was engaged in activity. Uh, and I thought about it. I've thought about it since. I was in my own personal process of radical change. I was really radically changing my life. And I was involved in a community that was also in a process of radical change. 
And at, when I think about that as a social worker, that's called parallel process, right? So there was these, this double thing going on with me personally and this community that I was now a part of. And there was a really, really nice synergy happening. So, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to, to get sober in New York City. And there's like 12 step meet gay, that's what they were called at the time, LGBT, uh, 12 step meetings all over the city, but really centered in lower Manhattan. And a lot of them were at the LGBT community center. So I'd be going to meetings there and I'd come out of the meetings and downstairs in the big auditorium would be ACT UP on Monday night, Queer Nation on Wednesday night, Wham! on Thursday night, and so I would just stay for those meetings. And what those organizations stand for, ACT UP is AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. Queer Nation just stands for Queer Nation. And WAM stands for Women's Health Action Coalition. And so some of the takeaways that I had from, those, from participating in those groups were this is whole idea of social justice and standing up for the, for the most vulnerable for having a voice for people who did not yet have a voice, and for cultivating that, those, those unspoken voices. And I'll talk about that in a minute. A connection between oppressed groups and this idea of disposable lives. And I think that's something that really still resonates with us, is whose lives matter. Um, and, uh, and fighting stigma uh, and in a plague whose lives matter and whose lives don't. And a connection between uh, ownership of body, so the connection between uh, women's control of their own bodies, the control of queer bodies, the control of drug users' bodies, the, tr the, the control the people with AIDS had of their own bodies. And that was a very, very strong connection for me to make because ownership of the body, aside from government regulation, is, is a very powerful thing, right? And so that I make the decisions about what I do or don't do with my body. It's not made for some other entity beyond me. I didn't have those tools to even think that way before all this happened. I, I, I knew it, but I didn't have the language. I didn't, I didn't have the community context for that to happen. So I want to take a step back, because I want to talk about some of the other things I learned from those groups. But there's two adages I want to talk about. And OK, so. I want, to go, I want to take a step even further back. So I was involved in community activism, and I'm going to talk about what that looked like. Um, and, and, and that was like a lot of anger-centered activity, right? And then I was also involved in other kinds of service. So I, I did service positions in my 12-step groups. I volunteered at this thing called Whole Foods Project that, that uh, did plant-based diets for people with compromised immune systems. Um, and I volunteered doing um, needle exchange because that was another thing that people in my community were doing. So since then, I've learned this, uh, this adage from a woman named Dr. Pat Deegan, and she talks about living at the intersection of love and anger, or at love and outrage. And I love that because so many people in recovery, we, we've been taught that anger is wrong and anger is not good for us and that anger will destroy us and potentially make us use. And I think that, that, you know, that that's one of those things you have to dig a little deeper in because anger properly channeled can be a very powerful vehicle, especially when it's tempered with love, right? So if you can, if you can keep the love and the anger sort of uh, in uh, in balance, not always the easiest thing to do, but if you can keep them in balance, very, very powerful vehicle, and lots of historical precedents about how this has worked. So it's just been really, really helpful for me. The other thing that, that um, it's a little embarrassing because I learned it on a bumper sticker. Um, I was uh, you know, driving on the highway, and, and, and the bumper in front of me said, comfort the disturbed, disturb the comfortable. And I, it was just, I, for me, it was a God moment, okay? So it was like, uh, like that whole idea of, of comforting and making room for the most vulnerable, and at the same, same time, always pushing the edge of complacency. You know, always a comfort, uh, disturbing the comfortable. And, and I think those two things, I think that fits really nicely with the love and outrage one, but they've been really sort of nice guideposts for me because they keep me in check of these two seemingly opposite polarities that really have a lot of intersection with each other.
So some of the other things that I learned from um, ACT UP, Queer Nation, and WAM were um, all of those groups had a very lean and nimble infrastructure. They were not 501c3s. Um, they, had their, they were just groups. They were just community groups that, that met and got shit done. And so they didn't have, like, they weren't social service. They were just direct action organizations calling attention to a social problem and, and proposing solutions. So um, I learned about uh, meeting design, about having two co-facilitators. In those days, it was one of male experience, one of female experience, to have that gender balance, to have consensus building, to have uh, uh, meetings where all voices were heard and decisions were made by consensus. Uh, very new to me. Uh, making room for lots of diverse voices. And then this idea of having a large group this size and then having these little pods of affinity groups so that if we did a large direct action, all of those affinity groups would have their own actions within an action plan. So, you know, 10 people may uh, uh, handcuff themselves to City Hall while, while five other people drop a banner off of the other building. And that stuff would happen in coordination and often simultaneously. And it would make a very amazing sort of media event. But it would also give people decision-making power. They didn't have to go through that consensus process. So that was a great learning for me. The power of direct action and civil disobedience when it was called for. And again, these were desperate times calling for desperate measures. So, so when actions happened, when it was, say, an action about FDA approval of a certain kind of drug, um, there were, that kind of theatrical action needed to happen. And then the, the other piece of that is insider-outsider. So, I, you know, in my life, I've been on both sides of the fence now. I've been the person hollering in the street, but I've also been the person on the inside that, like, if I'm invited to the banquet, I, I, mean, I go to the front door with an invitation, but I open the side door and let people in, you know? <laughs> If I, when I work for the government, I try to, to invite people who usually aren't invited to meetings, to, to, uh, to, to press levers, to open gates, to, to get those kind of voices of nothing about us without us into the meetings where they're needed the most. So it's that, that, you know, that insider, outsider. And all, oftentimes people on the inside will say, we, you know, I'm trying to do this on the inside, but it would be nice to have some pressure on the outside of people hollering in the street in order to get attention so that I can push this through with the people that I need to push it through. So, so it can work on both sides of the fence. The importance of language. Okay, so we've talked about language a lot, but I learned these lessons early on. And I learned what, what reclaiming language looked like to say the word queer, which was a very controversial term and probably still is, to say fag and dyke, and to own those terms that were, had been used against us, um, to, to reframe language, especially the media at the time would say people dying with AIDS, and we would say people living with AIDS. People, uh, the media would say AIDS victim. Uh, you know, like language that was really, really stigmatizing and, and, and inflammatory. And it, like, even having an action against the New York Times, which used the term homosexual and would refuse to, word, use, uh, refuse to use the word gay for years. And, and homosexual was just, it was such a potentially pathologizing term. And instead of gay, which was a community-based term that came up from the ground, right? And, and, and it was widely used across the country. But there was an obstinance of, of, of sticking to that old language because of, of, what, of the, the potency it held. So the language thing that we're dealing with in the recovery world right now, it's not new. Uh, it's always evolving. And it's always good to point at words that, that are either no longer useful or are, continue to be used against the people that they're, they're affecting, right? The other piece, it, I talked about the New York Times, and it, and it was using and controlling the media. And I had media training early on, especially when I was working with WAM, which was a women's uh, dominated group. And when I was doing an, a WAM action, the media would always come to who first? because they always go to a man. 
And so I was trained to say, well, you know, I've got a really good opinion on this, but you really should talk to Debbie about it because Debbie's an expert on this and always defer. And, and, and I think in all groups, especially when you're there as an ally, to always defer, to always pick the people that you may be the most respectable person the press wants to talk to, but always go to the most important and potent person. And then, you know, just the whole idea of, of sex positive uh, HIV prevention. I talked about needle exchange. It was, it was the same thing with distributing condoms. It was like, well, if you give people needles, they're going to use drugs. And if you give people condoms, they're going to have sex. Well, guess what? <laughs> like, I don't know what world you live in. <laughs> But I think, you know, this whole thing of, of pointing fingers and blaming people for bad behavior comes up again and again and again. And it's, you know, every time I think we've gotten a little farther, it just seems like it rears its ugly head up again. And I think in terms of public opinion and changing policymakers' uh, minds, it, it, it really is an evolutionary thing that, that's like message over and over and over. Um, you know, we talked about the word uh, substance abuse, uh, and there's research about it now, but William White and Bob Curley had articles in 2001 about that term and said the same exact thing. And so almost 20 years later, we're still having to remind people not to use that language, that it's, it's, it, that it's really damaging, that it's really hurtful, that, it, it, that it's affecting people's lives, that we're trying to help. And, and so it's, you know, it's, it, it's sometimes confounding how long some of this takes, but it, you know, it's like persistence and obstinance and saying it again and again and again, when, even when you're tired of saying it, right? So I said, I'm tired of saying I'm gay, I'm tired of saying I'm, I'm in recovery, but I, I have a responsibility, I have a duty, because we're, we're far enough along that we don't want to lose the ground that we've gained, even though sometimes on a daily basis it might think, is this doing any good? It is doing good. So I told you about all those things I learned. And so as I'm learning all this stuff, I'm, I'm also learning that this isn't the first time all this has happened. You know, and I've always been a little bit of a history buff, so I start reading. And I start reading about you know, the gay active, I, I read about Stonewall, and I read about the Gay Activist Alliance, and the Gay Liberation Front, and the, uh, the, the, the Street Revolutionary Action Transvestite Star, and I read about the Lavender Menace, and all the stuff that happened in the early 70s that really started building that infrastructure. But the activism was always there. So I remind you, you know, the, the uh, uh, sexual orientation, it, 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 homosexuality is no longer classified as a pathology in the DSM. I think it was the DSM-2 at the time. But it wasn't the, it wasn't the psychiatrist who changed that. It was the street activist who changed that. It was the community activist. And, and the more I read about this, the more I'm convinced that most meaningful social change comes from the ground up. And even when we're talking about recovery research, like a lot of those came from the recovery community saying, this isn't right. And we, and we need research that will prove what we're saying is true. So I, you know, re, I, re, researchers are always our best friends in terms of, uh, of folks who can quantify and qualify those truths that we know are self-evident. So I don't even know where I am in my notes now. So, uh, <laughs> so, so I looked at that. And then I looked at you know, the civil rights movement. When I was a kid. I was like in grade school in the 60s, and I was like always like very, very interested in what was going on. But I started reading about what some of those things looked like. And I, and I read about Miles Horton and the, the, the Highlander School, where they trained civil rights activists. And I read about Paula Freire, who had models of social change. And I read about Baird Rustin. And you know, a lot of people in this room probably know who Baird Rustin is, but the general public doesn't know who Baird Rustin is. We all know who Rosa Parks is, but who's Baird Rustin? And why don't people know that? Because he was gay. And they tried to de-gay him in order to make him palatable in, in a social justice movement. And that was the times, I understand that, but... but when you look at all of the queers throughout history that have been de-queered or erased entirely, we are not in the books. 
And we are everywhere in history. The more I read, the more I get, right? So, I, so this is a, another area where, yeah, I'm outraged. And I need to, to temper that with love in order to make that message more palatable. But it's like, that, but, so this has been systemic, right? And it's not just the LGBT community. You know, it's many, many other uh, oppressed communities have, have been erased from history. So I also read, speaking of, uh, of um, so writers activists like Audre Lorde and James Baldwin and Dorothy Allison, and, you know, when I read by Audre Lorde, the transformation of silence into language and action, that just crystallized so much for me because, because I, I realized, and I connected it with something that was more current at the time, which was from an ACT UP group called Grand Fury, Silence Equals Death. And you've probably seen that pink triangle and silence equals death. And that whole idea, because it, sp it, it, it spoke so much to my cowardice of being silent and not being seen and not being heard, and I, that I had to personally atone for, right? And so that, those things were so powerful that to stand up and speak out had so much power and to get other people to stand up and speak out because oftentimes uh, silence is complicity. You know? And, and if, if, if you don't speak, people think you're just going along with, with what they want. And so um, that was a, a very, very big turning point. So I also looked at the history of Alcoholics Anonymous because, you know, we read the 12 and 12, we read the big book, and that there was an entire history behind how those principles and values came about. And through that reading, I read about Mrs. Marty Mann. And I don't know if you guys know who Marty Mann was, but she was like the first wave of recovery advocates. And she was the sponsee of Bill, uh, uh, Bill Wilson, and she went out and she did community education about alcohol excuse me, alcoholism in the late 40s and early 50s and started an organization called the National Council on Alcoholism, which is now the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence, NCADD, which has just recently merged with Facing Addiction, Evolution Again. So Marty Mann, this courageous, courageous woman that with Bill Wilson's blessing broke her anonymity and went out and talked about her own alcoholism uh, as a woman, stigma, but there was another piece missing because Mrs. Marty Mann was married for a hot minute and, and it was annulled because she was a lesbian. And again, that piece got buried. And, and she had an amazing life in New York City with her partner, Priscilla, who was an interior designer at Bonwit Teller. You know, all these things that, that we would never know about her because we assumed that she was a married woman, married to a man, Mrs. Marty Mann. And so I, I was outraged about that because here's this piece of, of uh, my history of somebody that I identify with that I'm not allowed to make that connection with. And I've got to find that out on my own because the information's buried. So again, these themes pop up again and again of, of whose lives matter, whose don't, and whose lives need to be altered in order to be current and have currency, right? So, so I'm going to act up meetings, having a ball, um, flexing out some new muscles, and I'm at a meeting one night, and this, there's a period for uh, um, announcements. And this woman, Andy Gibbs, from the South, gets up. And she starts talking about her mothers, um, who uh, had this place in uh, Ovette, Mississippi, called Camp Sister Spirit. And we knew all about it, because we'd been reading about it in the gay papers. And it was even on, like, 2020 or 60 Minutes or something. There was a, 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 a lesbian feminist retreat center in rural Mississippi that these women opened, bought the land, opened up, and the entire community turned on them. And I mean turned on them. I mean, you know, gunshots, 
uh, killed one of their dogs, uh, uh, really nasty, nasty um, uh, graffiti every, uh, all on their property, uh, and then rumors that they were witches and were going to take uh, the men's wives and steal the babies. And, I mean, just out, out, outrageous stuff, right? So Andy's trying to, she's there, and she's, she's in New York for something else, and she's talking about what's happening down there, and any help, you know, that people can, can, can give would be great. So... Next day, I got on my rotary phone, 1992, no internet, no cell phone, uh, you know, no, no other way. And of course, they're not there. They're out doing things, and, like protecting the land or something. And so um, I, you know, I call again and again and again, and I finally get somebody, and I say, well, but, 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 well, you know, I'm not really sure what your policy of having men on the land is, but I'd like to come and help. And, and um, this woman goes, well, you can come down and help. She said, just one thing. I said, oh, no. Yeah, yeah. I think, oh, no, what is it? I said, yeah, well, what would that be? And she said, well, it's a clean and sober space. And I'm like, thank you. You know, because I'm like a couple years sober at this point. And I thought, this is where I'm, I'm, I need to be there, right? So I go down there. Uh, I, I fly to New Orleans. I get a ride to Ovet, Mississippi. And it's basically this old hog farm. Right? Now, I, I knew how to camp. Oh, they also said that I couldn't stay in the bunk, but they had a tent for me, and they could set me up. So, like, I, you know, I'm not afraid of snakes. I'm not afraid of bugs. I, I know how to camp. But they're like, this New York City boy's coming down to the country, and, we're, and so that they're ready to, like, ridicule me, right? So I set up my tent. Uh, I asked them if they have a five-gallon drum, because uh, they've got a spigot out by the hog barn, which is where, where my tent is. And, uh, and I, I rig up this little shower, and they're just very impressed that I could do such a thing. And, um, and, and I sort of it, it, it entrenched myself in the day-to-day -day activity. And so we mended fences, and they, they were doing a lot of building. And I, my dad's an electrician, and I, I, I helped them with electrical stuff and carpentry. And, uh, and just... I, you know, I was the only man with like 30 women, right? And they taught me, you know, they taught me how to use a chainsaw. It, 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 it was a nice experience. But, you know, uh, a, a few, it, it was also a very transformative ex experience because every day when the mail came in, they would all gather around and read the letters that people were sending. And... And sometimes the letters had money, and sometimes there would be, you know, like a box of toilet paper, like, and, and just like a lot of atta girls, you know, like just keep up, keep it up, like don't, you know, like you're doing the right thing, uh, the community will come around, like just hold the line. And it, it, I, I realized that when, I, and I've done this ever since, every time I read about something that's not happening in my neck of the woods where people are really exhibiting bravery and courage to send something, some acknowledgement. Because when you're in that day-to-day, -day, especially when you're isolated, it can feel like I, I don't have the energy to go on, right? And, and one letter or postcard of encouragement can get you through that next day. And that was such a realization to me because it was like, um, you know, you read about things like, that's great, that's happening, well, that's way in Mississippi, you know. And so um, the other thing that, 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 so there were two women that ran this, Wanda and Brenda Henson. Um, and they, they, they were married way before there was gay marriage. And they, um, they blended their families. And they said, you know, most of the support came from gay men, and they weren't expecting that. And, and, they, and it said they, it changed their opinion of gay men, because they were sort of separate, le lesbian separatists before that. And so I realized also the power to change minds, right? So every night after dinner, we'd sit on the porch, and we would talk, and they would ask me about what's going on in New York, and ACT UP they thought was such a cool thing, and, uh, and they'd, been to the, they'd been invited to the ACT UP march in the, in the Pride Parade that one year, and, and they were just so taken with all the support. And they, these two women, besides running, you know, building this thing and dealing with a really lot of negative, negative attention uh, that was really undermining to them, they were getting their PhDs in adult education. And, um, and they were telling me what that program was like. And they said, oh, you know, you need to go back to school. And like, you know, you, like, you could do a program like that. And, and, and so when I left there, 
I really did, I left with a new intention, and I, I left transformed. You know, I, I, I left with a new resolve, and I, and I, I didn't expect that. You know, I, I had learned in my recovery that service would transport you to a different place, but I didn't know it would work like that. And, 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 and so that's one of those pivotal moments in my life where I just, I showed up at the right place at the right time. And so from there, um, so I, I went back to New York City and I applied to schools. I couldn't find adult education anywhere. But somebody said, well, you know, uh, Hunter College has an MSW program in community organizing, and you might want to do that. And I, you know, I learned all this community organizing stuff from, from ACT UP and Queer Nation, and I thought, well, I'll give it a try, right? I only wanted to apply, to, I, I, I only wanted to go to, I didn't want to have to move my, my, my uh, rent-controlled apartment. <laughs> so I only wanted to go to school in, in, in Manhattan. <laughs> And I only applied to one school, because that was the school I wanted to go to, I decided. And in my application, I wrote that I was a gay man in recovery. And, I, and that was my whole, app, you know, my essay was all about that, and all the things that I had learned in early recovery. And, you know, I don't know if that was the wisest thing to do, um, but it worked, you know, and I got in. And, 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 and then my life just completely changed again, because I was an artist. I didn't, I didn't want to be a social worker. I thought social workers were the ones who came and tried to take your kids away from you, um, for, you know, the, like the welfare workers, you know? And so I, I had a lot of learning to do, clearly. And so um, it, it, from that, it, it, you know, my, my life just kept moving on and on and on until I did my uh, second year internship at the, the LGBT Community Center in the Public Policy Department that I started the internship. Because this, by this time in my life, I'm, I'm learning how to make things happen, right? I'm not just waiting for them to happen. I, I'm going to make them happen. And so through that, a couple years later, I got hired back to do this really cool project that was a, a SAMHSA-funded um, project called Recovery Community Services Program in 1998. And... Uh, it was 19 grantees across the country that were supposed to mobile, organize and mobilize the recovery community. And so uh, I, the project I started was called LGBT Voices of Recovery. And we w went across uh, New York. It was a statewide organizing. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm cutting a lot of this out. But I just want to tell you some of the things that we found out when we went across the country. What we did was we didn't call them focus groups. We had like dinner sessions. And we would either have people have this to their house, or we do it at the, the community center or so, library or something. And we would, we would have food, and then we would just have people talk about LGBT people, LGBT people in recovery talk about what their experience was like in recovery. And so they talked about treatment, and they talked about how they were bullied in treatment, and how when they were bullied by other people in treatment, the, the administration and the clinicians didn't stick up for them. They st stuck up for the people who were bullying them. Uh, and they, they tried to talk about their queerness in groups, and they were told not to talk about that shit, to leave it out at the door. They were here for their recovery. This is 1998, 99, 2000. I, don't, I hope it's changed. Uh, they talked about um, uh, lack of access to health care in general. They talked about lack of community-based support. Sometimes they might have one gay identified 12-step meeting, sometimes not. They would have to change pronouns. They would have to do all kinds of things. And then for trans folk that we talked about, like all of this times 100. Like the, the atrocities people were witnessing in treatment in terms of bathrooms and gender pronouns and all these things that, I, again, I hope this stuff has been resolved because the way people were treated, not as human beings because of their sexuality or their gender fluidity, um, uh, it was an atrocity. And so we started calling attention to this stuff. And so, you know, throughout all this was other themes of trauma, trauma, trauma. You know, we've talked about that this morning. Um, that, and there were other things going on. It wasn't just people uh, using and misusing and addicted to substances. There were behaviors involved. There was cutting. There were suicidal tendencies. There were all these things that pointed to low, low self-esteem, self-hatred, all of those things that I knew so intimately because those were the things that kept me in hiding. 
You know, those were the things that I, th I thought my silence would protect me. And it didn't. It hurt me. But I was convinced that I was unlovable. I was convinced that I was flawed. I was convinced that I was God's mistake because that's what I heard all around me. All around me, all the time. And again, I think some of this has changed, but I'm not sure enough of it has. So, so in, the, in the recovery movement, I have, I have a lot of friends and a lot of colleagues, and I have a very good gay friend in this recovery movement, and he always says to me, why it got to be gay? Like, why, do you have to, why, why does it have to be gay this and lesbian this and trans that? And for me, that queer focus is so, so important because we have been erased from history. And so remember what I said about Marty Mann. And remember what I said about Baird Rustin. There's many, many people throughout history who have been eradicated or de-queered. And so... Um, You know, somebody said earlier today about the reason why no one's taken action is because people hate drug users. And I think, you know, if you look back to AIDS, the reason why action wasn't taken was because people despise us. And that's a hard thing to say out loud. And, and when your own self-hatred outranks any other hatred you receive, that's, you know, it's like, at the end of the day, what keeps you going the next day? Like, you've got so many reasons to feel bad about yourself. And so, you know, I just want to say that I, I, I know we have, because I have absorbed these messages. I have internalized these messages. I know that when I talk about being addicted, I, I, when I talk about being queer, I, I, know, I can tell you most of the shame is gone, but there is a bottom. <laughs> There's a bottom line that's very, very hard to get rid of. And I think that that's, you know, that's where all the recovery work comes in. That's why you don't get cured. It's like this is constant, constant work. But, you know, I think that our resiliency is worth everything. And I'd love to, you know, the researcher who started off this morning and talked about that lotus in the murky water. I'd never heard that one before, but I'm going to use that one. And so, so why has it got to be gay? Because it's a vital part of who we are. And shutting down our queerness shuts out our personhood. You know, it's like uh, it undermines the wholeness that we've developed as part of our recovery, limits our contributions. And, you know, it's like I really do believe that, that queerness does matter. It, I think it's a gift. And I think that if, if we position it the right way, it's, it's the service of recovery. It's the duty of us to give that gift back. And so I want to be able to sort of, you know, to my friend who's, who's gay and says, why I got to be gay, I want to, I, I try to convince him that we need to lift this up in a way that not only makes us feel good, but contributes to everybody. So I want to talk about my sister. And so my partner and I are on the phone with my sister a year ago. And we're talking about my nephew, who's gay and, and, and has some, some addiction issues, and is talking about, um, and is, is, is in the closet. And it's so much like my story, you know? And I don't know how to reach him. And so my sister kept saying, she goes, I tell him, I don't care that you're gay. I love you. And we said, well, what about a reframe here? You know, what if you said... I love that your gayness is part of the whole person I love. Like, what if you reframed it in a way that you really validated his gayness in a way of saying, you don't care, you love him anyway. It's sort of like, I love you because of, as opposed to I love you in spite of. And she had never really thought about that before. I had. But she hadn't thought about that before, and she said, well, you know, maybe I, I, that's, I've never thought about that. Let me, I, let me give that some thought. And so, you know, I thought th therein lies part of the problem, because even with this recovery stuff, you know, it's like I get tired of 
having to sort of raise my hand again and again and say, yeah, but, um, but what about the gay people over here? Or, yeah, but what about the recovery people over here? You know, it's like, and, and it's, it's sort of like part of me self-edits because I can hear them going, oh, there he goes again with that gay stuff and that recovery stuff. And so, you know, that's all my internal stuff, right? But, but I also think it happens, right? So I have to constantly say, yes, stand up. Yes, raise your hand. Yes, open your mouth. Yes, do it again. Because until we keep doing that, nothing's going to change. And that's how things change, I'm convinced. So I'll, I'll tell you one more story. And this is more recent. So in November, I was in San Francisco, and I was at this meeting with about 25 people, experts in hepatitis C, and I was the only one who um, self-identified. And we, you know, we spent a day and a half talking about hepatitis screening in various health locations and, and how to sort of get traction on that. And at the very end of, of the second day, this woman said, you know, what we need is we need a, a Ryan White. We need, like, we need an innocent victim to really like, you know, like get, get the hearts and minds of people you know, around this issue. And I'm like... Up, up, up goes my hand, and I said, if I don't say this, I'm going to hate myself for a whole week. <laughs> you know, I've got a lump in my throat. And I said, you know, when you talk about innocent victims, it really, really hurts. Because the, the, the opposite of innocent victim is people who brought it on themselves, and it's their fault. And that's exactly what we're trying to change. And I thought, you know, I said it in 1992, I said it in 1997, I said it in 2005, and it's having to say it again. And it just shows how deep some of these attitudes go. And she owned it right away, and she apologized profusely, but it's like, it's, it's almost instantaneous. And, 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 and you know, these, these social mores are so entrenched in our thinking and our behavior and our culture, and, it, you know, it's a heavy, heavy lift. So, I've been a part of this recovery movement for 20 years. I've seen a lot of change. I've seen a lot of, of, of progress. I'm, I'm sort of amazed. I'm amazed that three young people can sit uh, at a panel in front of a conference and talk about their recovery and their life in a collegiate recovery program. It's things that we dreamed about 20 years ago. We have infrastructure in place that we didn't have. We have a long way to go, but we have done so much in terms of building uh, a full-fledged recovery community. We have recovery housing. We have recovery community centers. We have recovery high schools. We have recovery employment. We have, we have all of these things that we've built and, and, uh, and really finessed over the years. And, you know, in the course of all that, if you go back to Devin's message, you know, I think we are essentially a white middle class movement. And I think that, uh, that we, are, we do not have, you know, a, a very sophisticated political and social analysis of our movement and how power affects our movement and how criminalization affects our movement. Uh, the harm reduction people really have it much further along in terms of their analysis of that. But I think, you know, one of the things I learned uh, when we did speak out in New York, we went all across the straight state and we had lesbians, gay men, bisexuals, and people of trans and gender variant experience involved from the beginning. We tried, we did reach out to the communities of color. Uh, we tried to have a really multicultural identity and, and, uh, and I, that takes an amazing amount of work and I don't think we've been very good at sustaining that. And so what I represent as a queer person in the recovery movement, uh, and I've been doing this for 20 years, sometimes I feel like it falls on uh, ears that aren't yet ready to hear. Um, and I'll say things that will just go very, very flat. 
Um, and I'll talk about uh, you know, connections to AIDS and connections to the LGBT movement and looking at the gay marriage movement and how we might sort of, you know, like use that as strategies to move forward and, and get some amazing gains. And I still feel this resistance of people pulling back because it's not them and they don't identify. And so, you know, it's like, this is a, another turning point for me because I want to queer up our movement. You know, I want to make room for, for every person of color. I want to make room for people of low income status. I, you know, I feel like if, if addiction affects everybody as an equal opportunity employer, we need to be able to have recovery affect everybody as an equal opportunity employer. And it breaks my heart that that we have fallen short. And I think, you know, to do that, you know, many, I'm sure many of you know, if, if you have an all white board, it takes an intention to bring in people of color and diversify the balance. If you have people with no lived experience, it takes intention to, to create that balance. Staff, board, th throughout our organization, if you do not have the intention, it will not happen. And it is hard, hard work, especially when we're doing lots of other hard work. But if we want to build something really powerful, and not just for a few, but for everybody, and that's what social justice is about, I think that we really have to have that clear intention and that North Star moving forward. So I'm committed to doing that. Um, I'm committing to bring every aspect of myself to this work uh, in a more visible, vocal, vibrant way. And I, and I invite all of you to do the same. And I think that's all I got.